Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order this hearing of the Health Finance and Policy Committee. As always, we will begin with taking the roll. Ms. Niedernhofer. Liebling. Present. Hewitt. Hewitt. Schumacher. Schumacher, present. Ackland. Ackland, present. Becker. Becker, present. Bonner. Present. Bierman. Present. Bolden. Present. Damoth. Present. Freiburg. Present. Grunhagen. Present. Keel. Keel. Morrison. Morrison, present. Munson. Munson. Prior. Present. Quam. Present. Present. Ryer. Present. Schultz. Wolgamot. Wolgamot, present. A quorum is present. All right. Thank you, Ms. Niedernhofer. The next order of business then is approval of the minutes of March 9th and our Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion to approve the minutes from March 9th. All right. Thank you. So the motion is before us. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Bierman. So the first bill on the agenda today is House File 4113, Representative Vang. And uh, Representative Vang is not a member of our committee, so the chair will move that House File 4113 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. Welcome, Representative Vang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, House File 4113 uh, builds on the work of uh, retaining mental health providers in the workforce. Uh, sometimes fulfilling supervision requirements is a barrier often cited for mental health professionals. Uh, this bill closes the gap in becoming supervisors by covering costs for supervision required for professionals to become supervisors and pursuing a license ensure at the professional level. Um, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, I will yield my time for my testifier. All right, thank you very much, Representative Vang. So uh, we have Zora Radosevich from the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. Welcome. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Zora Radosevich, uh, Director of the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care with the Minnesota Department of Health. And this bill builds on, um, as Representative Vang said, that the work that was done last year in passing um, legislation to allow us to um, support uh, mental health providers from communities of color and underrepresented communities become supervisors. And as we were preparing to, to um, administer this program and, and put an RFP out, it became clear that the cost of the supervisor's time is another issue that does come up. And, um, and so we wanted to see if it was possible to allow that to be one of the eligible costs for this program um, in the second year. And the other issue is that these were this program was funded with funds that needed to be spent by March 30th of 2024. And so because we weren't sure of what the immediate demand would be, that this might be something that took a little bit of time to get off the ground, that it would also be great if we could use these funds to, um, to support the need to just get the supervision for um, mental health providers as they seek to become licensed. And so that's what the bill does, and I'm willing to, happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Radosevich. Um, okay. Um, are there any questions from members to the bill or any discussion? All right. Not seeing any. So, um, Representative Vang, final word on the bill? Uh, no, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to thank you and the and the committee for your time and consideration, and I look forward to your support. All right, thank you. 
So um, House File 4113 is laid over for possible inclusion. And now we will move to 4112, which is also Representative Vang's bill. And the chair will move that House File 4112 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. And so Representative Vang to 4112. Thank you, Madam Chair. So 4112 does two things. Um, it adds membership to the Rural, Rural Health Advisory Committee and establishes the Health Equity Advisory Leadership, also known as HEAL Council. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Department of Health has relied on its partnership with the HEAL Council before and throughout the sheer trauma of the COVID-19 pandemic. A HEAL provides forthright and constructive feedback on the strategic direction of both the Center for Health Equity and MDH as a whole regarding health equity. HEAL provides Minnesotans from communities who have spent decades feeling voiceless and unrepresented an opportunity to be included in the conversation. A HEAL Council is an effective strategy to listen to our communities and their concerns, and our concerns. The HEAL Council works closely with local communities. It proactively supports MDH to respond to the community needs as they arise and provides MDH with context and information about uh, community needs. Minnesotan families, especially those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, including BIPOC and minority communities, are trying to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. The past two years have been historically traumatizing for most. Heal Council plays a critical role in supporting and advising MDH to effectively respond to the pandemic with culturally and linguistically appropriate strategies. Uh, the pandemic will leave um, so many disparities and equities behind. Um, any earnest path forward in addressing systematic inequities requires working alongside groups like Heal, which uh, has worked to establish deep authentic connections uh, within our communities. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I will yield the rest of my time to my supplier. All right, thank you very much, Representative Vang. So first, again, we have um, Ms. Radosevich from the Department of Health. And welcome, and we have to go through the routine again and state your name again. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Zora Radosevich, Director of the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care in the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, this, this bill, as Rep Representative Ng stated, expands the um, membership of the Rural Health Advisory Committee by adding um, five new members, um, a member of a tribal nation, um, a member of a local public health or community health board, a health professional or an advocate who's working with people with mental illness, and then a representative of a community organization working with people who experience health disparities, and also a member with experience in economic development. In addition, the bill um, broadens the requirement um, in subdivision one class seven to allow an oral health professional rather than specifying that it be a dentist um, for that role. Um, that was a recommendation that came up from the Rural Health Advisory Committee in their 2000 or 2018 um, report on strengthening the oral health system in rural Minnesota uh, for a variety of reasons, which I can get into if you'd like. Um, and generally that because the healthcare economy affects and is so affected by the general economy of a community, the community felt it would be um, it would be helpful to be more conscientiously engaged with the economic development sector, as well as population health experts. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Radasevich. Um, next testifier we have is Aya Mohammed. Uh, if you are here, welcome. Okay, I'm not seeing or hearing, I am Mohammed, unless you're here and you're muted. I'm here, can you hear me? Oh yes, now we can, welcome. If you could just uh, introduce yourself and uh, go ahead and tell us, give us your testimony, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Aya Mohammed, and I'm an Afro-Arab Muslim with a background in community and public health. I've had the privilege of serving as a member of the HEAL Council since 2019, representing African refugee immigrant communities in the Metro. Eliminating health disparities that disproportionately impact BIPOC and socially marginalized communities 
is an arduous yet necessary task that the HEAL Council is committed to. While NDH has made progress towards this, the work is far from done and requires working alongside groups like HEAL. Formalizing the HEAL Council at the state level is a crucial step in eliminating health disparities in Minnesota. HEAL advises MDH to center anti-racism in its strategies and make internal and outfacing systems and operations more equitable. The HEAL Council makes it possible for MDH to collaborate with community leaders from diverse backgrounds, specifically those impacted by health inequities like myself, to work towards dismantling systems of inequities and improving the health of all Minnesotans. MDH has relied on its partnership with the HEAL Council to strengthen and broaden its relationships with communities in order to inform MDH's response efforts to community needs as they arise. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Mohammed. And um, next we have Idol Abdul. And um, welcome, Ms. Abdul. And I would like to point out to the committee that uh, she uh, submitted a letter, which I would ask you all to look at. And uh, so, Ms. Abdul, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, um, again, for the opportunity to testify and give you my testimony in this bill about health equity and health disparities in Minnesota. Um, I feel like I've seen a bill like this too many times during my advocacy of over 10 years now, and I appreciate what the representative and the previous testimony, testimony, uh, testifier, Ayan Mohammed, had said. Uh, but many legislators in this body and the Senate have created and passed health equity councils before. There have been recommendations and reports. Nothing fruitful have been produced from them because we never get to the production part. Um, always the advice and the council portion. Black, brown, and Native Americans in Minnesota are at the bottom of every kit in health, education, and in between. We don't always need council members to tell us what we already know, feel, and live with. What we need is state legislators to graduate from councils to holding the health and human services agencies accountable for creating and enhancing and maintaining disparities. You see members, as a black woman, I don't say in the morning, I'm gonna have a cup of coffee, a bowl of cereal and disparities. Racial disparities are created by both the Minnesota Department of Health and DHS leadership. Um, for example, ask Minnesota Department of Health why there are almost, maybe none now, because I haven't advocated there for a while, either directors, middle management, or supervisors who are black and brown. Ask the current commissioner why she interviewed a Somali mayor research doctor with a PhD more times than I can count, but never hired him. Um, my, my guess is that People who are, don't look like me don't have that many interviews, and if they do, they are definitely hired. Just in autism, the MDH department, even though they're in charge and get funded to do assessments and assurance, they never really do it. Um, they're supposed to do outreach to all communities and let us know the signs and symptoms and support and services that, that's available. Ask the current governor or any previous governor, how many black and brown DHS and MDH commissioners have been appointed? And please don't tell us there are no qualified ones. There are plenty who are qualified. That creates disparities. That is how you get rid of disparities. Um, the ability to give opportunities to all of us that white Minnesotans seem to enjoy. As the Department of Human Services, why so many black and brown employees quit or get fired, ask them why there is a toxic environment for black and brown employees. Ask them why there are so many who sued and won. Ask DHS why black and brown providers are disproportionately shut down, closed, while white providers are trained, nurtured, and supported. I could go on and on and on, but I appreciate what the council is trying to do. I appreciate what all of you and Liebling, you've been in our corner for over a decade since I've known you. But at some point, we got to get from the council part to the actual doing part. And we have to hold the health and the human services leadership accountable for failures. Thank you again for your time. Well, Ms. Abdul, thank you for your testimony and thank you for always watching and being an advocate also. Appreciate that. 
Okay, um, that is the end of our scheduled testifiers. Um, uh, Representative Vang, did you want to respond or have just even, well, I've been, I, do we do have a question, so maybe I should hold on going to you and, and let's um, let members ask questions if that's okay, and then we'll give you the final word. Um, Representative Damon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Vang, for bringing this forward. Um, as I'm looking at the bill, I think, Madam Chair, my question would be for Ms. Radazovich, um, specifically where on line uh, 2.1, where we've changed the dentist to the oral health professional. And I know Ms. Radazovich said that it was based on the report out of 2018, and she could expound a little bit more. But if I could understand that piece a little bit more, I would appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Radazovich? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Demuth. Um, the Rural Health Advisory Committee in 2018 um, had completed a report on strengthening the oral health system in rural Minnesota, and they did discuss um, and recommended the permanent inclusion of an oral health professional on the Rural Health Advisory Committee. Um, and so that had been the recommendation of the committee and it allows for a broader opportunity for selection. It doesn't preclude or exclude dentists from being selected, um, just allows another, an, an oral health provider or dental therapist or others to be considered in that role. Um, Many of the oral health, um, the issues facing rural Minnesota have really relied on um, a, a team approach or a broader, um, broader professional um, opportunities for um, mid-level professionals and um, to solve some of the, the issues facing oral health in rural in rural areas. Um, I'm going to, we have a, uh, the Department of Human Services has a dental services advisory committee that focuses specifically on oral health services. And we work also with the, um, the Minnesota State Oral Health Program at MDH that prepared a 2030 oral health report that also called for, or just recognize that there's a fairly low concentration of dentists in rural areas and really promoting an interdisciplinary team approach. And in order to just facilitate that, we just wanted to have that broader definition um, as recommended by the committee in, in statute. Representative Damon, follow up. I appreciate that explanation and thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my, my thinking on this is um, I understand the challenges that are in rural Minnesota or greater Minnesota with the access to dentistry. And it's something that when I first became aware of that a number of years ago that I've been working toward, um, my thought is maybe we need to look at including the oral health professional, but also not eliminating the dentist um, piece on there too. Maybe we need two representations from that industry or that, that profession on there. So just a thought. Okay, thank you, Representative Damoth. And uh, they're not eliminating, they're just making broader, but I take your point, it could be that it's not a dentist, it's a different professional. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair. And actually you provided a great segue into uh, my first question with this on the, the piece with the, the, the broadening. Are there any other professions that the Rural Health Advisory Committee, which I've served on now for I think six or maybe eight years, um, are there any other categories that the department's looking at um, expanding on. And then just in the interest of time, the other question that I had was, um, have any dentists applied for, for this position? And um, have there been any that have been moving through the, the process with that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Schumacher. Ms. Radosevich? Um, yes, Madam Chair and Representative Schumacher. Um, we do understand that dentists have applied and um, will, this is the current, this is current law. And so I think we'll be appointed. Um, and we had a dentist who served, who actually chaired the rural health advisory report that recommended an oral health, that the language be oral health provider. Um, but he just rotated off the committee um, a year or two ago. So my assumption is that we will have a dentist on the committee when those appointments for this year are made. And I believe the application time has 
closed. And so we're expecting that to happen in either later this month or in April. Okay, thank you. Follow up, Representative Schumacher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the, the response on that. Um, just again, on the um, expansion of any other professions there, are there any other areas that are being looked at to broaden the category? Thank you. Ms. Radosevich. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Schumacher, um, we, we do call for a health profession professional or advocate working with people with mental illness. And we don't specify that it needs to be like a psychiatrist and a mental health professional in a different category. It's just one general category among those that we're um, seeking to expand the categories for. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else, Representative Schumacher? No, no, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, are there any other questions or discussion from members before we go to Representative Bang? All right, not seeing any. So Representative Bang, uh, final word or words. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just want to thank the committee for your time on hearing this bill. Um, I just want to recognize uh, Ms. Abdul's concerns and frustrations. I do agree uh, with your frustrations on, you know, but I, I think the bill uh, doesn't, isn't just a checkbox for uh, DHS or in, uh, NDH to just say they've done equity work. I think this um, uh, establishing the HEAL Council is, is a, uh, the right direction uh, in, in continuing that guidance to continue to do that work of equity work. It doesn't stop there. Um, I think that we can still establish this council while also addressing the concerns that you raised uh, there too, Ms. Abdul. Um, and I just wanna uh, thank um, Representative um, for the conversations. And if there are concerns, I am open to having those um, conversations as well. And just wanna thank you again and look forward to your support. All right, thank you so much, Representative Vang. So with that, House File 4112 is laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. So thank you. Next up, we have House File 4000. Representative Hewitt, 4000, somehow you got the 4000th bill. But anyway, welcome. Thank you, Anyone? Madam. Oh, sorry. I was sorry. I was going to say I see there's an amendment. Did you want to move that first, Madam Chair? I do. Okay. So Representative Hewitt is moving that House File 4000 be laid over for possible inclusion in the Health Bill, and then he is moving the A1 Authors Amendment to put the bill in the shape in which he would like to have it discussed. So let's adopt the amendment and uh, then we can discuss the bill as amended. So all in favor of adoption of the A1 Authors Amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Representative Hewitt to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Minnesota Department of Health is responsible for licensing, inspection, and enforcement activities related to certain radioactive materials and radiation producing equipment. Page got lost here, sorry. Um, the reason for this bill changes uh, are because of changes in the federal conformity. In 2005, the federal government updated its definition of byproduct materials to include additional types of radioactive material. Minnesota rules were updated for compatibility for the federal law at that time. However, the statute has not been updated yet. Today, I have with me people from the Department of Health to explain more about this and answer questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Hewitt. And, and according to my cheat sheet here, we, we don't have anyone who wants to actually testify, but there are folks available for questions. And I appreciate your explanation of the bill. Do members have questions? I know that when you read this bill, it, it is very technical and I personally didn't know what it was doing, but the explanation I think is very helpful. Our, um, any members with particular questions? All right, not seeing any. And um, so uh, with that, uh, anything further you wanna say, Representative Hewitt? 
Nope, I renew my motion. I thank Representative Quam for giving me a break and not asking technical scientific questions. <laughs> okay, Representative Hewitt, that's kind of what I was waiting for too, but you, you dodged that one. So House File 4000, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. So thank you very much. And then the next Hewitt bill is House File 3975. So I think Representative Hewitt is going to move that House File 3975 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. And this one also has an A1 amendment. So Representative Hewitt. I move to adopt the A1 amendment, Madam, Speak Madam Chair. Okay, so the A1 amendment is before us, and uh, again, I, I'm assuming that this one is just, uh, we're just going to put the bill in the order in which the author would like to discuss it, and then we can discuss it. Okay, so uh, all in favor of adoption of the A1 author's amendment, please say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Okay, Representative Hewitt, your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nursing homes and boarding care homes conduct assessments of facilities, facility restaurant residents based on the assessment schedule. These assessments determine residents' case mix classification, which are then used to determine nursing home and boarding care home reimbursement. Right now, facility staff must complete a significant change in status assessment, which is called an SCSA, each time all therapies in isolation have ended. Regardless whether or not there have been changes in care as a result of isolation therapy. House file 3975 seeks to reduce the administrative burden and allow staff to repurpose their assessment time towards residential care needs. Again, I have people from the Department of Health here to answer any questions on this bill. All right, thank you, Representative Hewitt. And could you just you know, tell us what did the amendment do? Was that just technical update or date or what did it do? Yep, it put the bill, basically it was a technical update that, they, uh, that the department found after the bill was put out. So they had the amendment posted. Okay, great, thank you very much. Questions for members, and again, we do have we have folks here that can answer questions. They're not listed as testifiers, however. So, if you feel like you don't understand what we're doing here, please ask. Okay, not seeing any questions. So I don't know, Representative Hewitt, you're scaring off all the questions today. So, uh, final word on the bill. Thank you, members, and thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, and helping me get through these two bills. I appreciate it. All right. So with that, House File 3975, as amended, is laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. Thank you very much, Representative Hewitt, and potential testifiers. Question answers. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have House File 3871, Representative Morrison. And Representative Morrison would be moving that House File 3871 be re referred to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. And with that, it, the floor is yours, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, House File 3871 is a bill to empower the Minnesota Cancer Reporting System. The purpose of the bill is to bring the Minnesota Cancer Reporting System, or MCRS, into compliance with CDC requirements by allowing Minnesota to share cancer registry information with other state-based cancer registries, the CDC, and the National Cancer Institute. This allows sharing individual level data with other state cancer registries to ensure medical follow-up with patients and the completeness of data for cancer investigations and reports. This will also ensure that Minnesota data are shared with national legally authorized public health authorities to identify emerging trends for cancer. This is important because Minnesota is the only state that is not in compliance with this CDC requirement and is susceptible to losing federal funding for the Minnesota Cancer Reporting System. A requirement of CDC funding is for the MCRS, um, for the MCRS is exchanging data with other state-based registries 
and Minnesota continuing to be out of compliance makes Minnesota susceptible to losing funding. Minnesota's two NCI designated comprehensive cancer care centers, the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota rely on the MCRS for their certification. A state-based registry is needed as part of their NCI applications, and these reapplications are coming up soon. These two centers bring in over $74 million in research funding to Minnesota. The data is only being shared with other state-based registries, the National Cancer Institute and CDC. Another important point is that Minnesota is not eligible for other CDC funding opportunities, such as becoming a SEER site. SEER sites receive millions more in funding and greatly enhance state registries to better understand cancer treatments and treatment outcomes, critical information to support research of our academic partners, and, uh, and more importantly, effectively treat and manage Minnesota cancer patients. And before I close, I just want to highlight why this change really is so important. Cancer is the leading cause of death among Minnesotans. Approximately four in 10 Minnesotans will develop cancer in their lifetimes. There are almost 31,000 cancers every year in Minnesota, and over 263,000 Minnesotans are cancer survivors. We owe it to them, to ourselves, and to future Minnesotans to get this right so that we can optimize cancer care in our state. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much, Representative Dr. Morrison, and uh, very good. And so we have um, uh, here to testify today, we have Dr. Cheryl Willman, and uh, welcome Dr. Willman, and please introduce yourself and tell us who you are and go ahead with your testimony. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Representative Morrison, and members of the committee. First of all, it's my honor to be here and be back in Minnesota. Uh, I was born in Iowa, grew up and went to college and medical school uh, in Minnesota. And I've just recently returned to become the new executive director of Mayo Clinic's cancer programs here in Minnesota, across the nation and our global sites. I want to support uh, this legislation very strongly. I think Representative Morrison gave you a beautiful explanation for why this change in law is so essential. Today, the NCI, or National Cancer Institute, designated cancer centers, and we're proud to hold that designation along with the University of Minnesota, have to reach out to our communities to prove to the nation that we're overcoming Minnesota's cancer challenges. To do that, we have to understand the patterns that most significantly affect our population and use that data to determine if our interventions are actually effective. We also use this data to track and report our patients, as Representative Morrison said. So not to have fully accurate data of Minnesotans, if a Minnesotan leaves and goes to New York or Texas to receive their cancer care, we don't think they need to do that, but some do, we can't access that data because of this legislation. Similarly, when Mayo is treating many individuals from around the United States and world, we again can't transmit that data to other states so other states can benefit from that knowledge. An important point I would make about data privacy issues is that the nation's tumor registries like Minnesota's, which is a very fine registry, act essentially like health systems. They're required under very strict federal and state statutes to maintain the privacy of every individual patient whose data goes into a registry. So when Mayo or Minnesota or anyone is looking at data, we're only allowed to see fully anonymized, de-identified, aggregated data so we can look at patterns and trends. So the data protection policies of these registries is just as intensive as you would expect uh, for any health systems. And finally, to close, um, I ran the tumor registry in the state of New Mexico Cancer Center in uh, New Mexico and have worked with programs in Arizona. And the federal funding that's available to these registries now to greatly extend cancer prevention, screening, and surveillance programs is in the tens of millions of dollars. And I think Minnesota really needs to be able to benefit from these federal funds from NCI and CDC to continue to modernize and improve our state's uh, cancer surveillance program. So thank you very much uh, for being here and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Willman and welcome to Minnesota. We're glad you're here. Our loss or our gain and somebody's loss. I don't know if that was New Mexico, but anyway, we're, we're glad to have you. Um, Dr. Logan Spector, welcome. 
Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Logan Spector at the University of Minnesota. I am a childhood cancer epidemiologist and uh, therefore I'm um, one of the nation's largest users of cancer registry data. Uh, I've also consulted with uh, the North American Association of Central Cancer Registries, um, as well as with SEER and the NCI and the CDC. Um, and uh, I will tell you that uh, cancer registration is uh, a, an absolute uh, boon to research and to the health uh, of children and adults who um, have uh, cancer. And it's very important that we get a population-wide uh, understanding of um, cancer with complete enumeration. Um, because if we have a volunteer-based registry, we are guaranteed to have bias in that data and make um, incorrect conclusions from it. Um, because we have a, a federated system of cancer registries, it requires that we have uh, data sharing between states, between registries, in order to uh, make sure that we uh, aren't double counting cases, uh, we need to use the identifiers, um, people's names, um, in order to make sure that uh, people only get counted once. And I think this is particularly important for a state like Minnesota, where we have a large contingent of snowbirds who may live in another state um, and, and develop cancer there while still being a resident of Minnesota. It needs to be counted here. Other states have, uh, are increasingly um, not sharing with us because we cannot share with them and that will degrade our cancer registration. And as uh, Representative Morrison and Dr. Willman mentioned, it also puts uh, at risk millions of dollars in federal funding for uh, cancer research and to uh, maintain the registry. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, we have Natasha Chernyavsky. And, and I also do want to remind members, too, that this bill is going to Judiciary and Civil Law, which is the data committee. So please welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Natasha Chernyavsky, and I'm the Legislative and Policy Specialist for Citizens Council for Health Freedom, or CCHF. Our organization exists to protect patient and doctor freedom, and I am here today to testify in opposition to HF 3871. CCHF believes patients have the right to privacy, including a right under Minnesota Constitution, Article 1, Section 10, to be protected from warrantless searches and seizures of their data by the government. The cancer surveillance system has long violated the individual's right to privacy because it does not require consent of the cancer patient for the ongoing collection of their personal data. And it also does not require the consent of patients before the state and third party contractors contact them. HF 3871 seeks to expand this privacy violation in two ways. First, in lines 1.8 through 1.17, consent from the practitioner is being eliminated. It is um, replaced by a notification requirement that could easily be missed or ignored by the practitioner, meaning that the practitioner may not notice it in time to forewarn the patient. Removing physician consent removes any protection for the patient, allowing the state to barge unwanted and without warning into the life of the cancer patient and their family. Second, lines 1.18 through 2.5 allow personally identifiable data including name and social security numbers to be shared with 49 other states in the federal government. These proposed changes bring up three questions I would like you all to think about. First, what qualifies as physician notification? Second, is the plan to conduct ongoing research on these individuals around the country without their consent? Third, what would cancer patients think about their identifiable data being shared nationwide without that consent? Madam Chair, members of the committee, HF 3871 violates patient privacy rights, eliminates the only protection cancer patients have against being contacted by the state or third-party contractors, authorizes the sharing of identifiable patient data nationwide, and can be expected to cause anxiety and resentment in patients when they realize just how broadly their personal and medical data is being shared without their consent. Thus, we oppose 3871. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, 
So uh, I think uh, at this point we have uh, Representative Munson has his hand up and uh, so we'll go to discussion and uh, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair um, <clears throat> and uh, Representative Morrison uh, for bringing this bill forward. Um, Minnesota, I mean, you, you talk about Minnesota being out of compliance and I mean, it's, it's important for people to know that Minnesota has some of the strictest uh, laws on protecting patient privacy. It's there for a reason. And um, we, everyone in this committee would be um, remiss if we didn't remember that, that health data is one of the most uh, frightening discrimination thing. I mean, if you have, if, if, the, if your records are out there for having a cancer or some cost to your employer, um, it can be used as discrimination. This is something that we have to protect, absolutely have to protect. And this, this bill is removing these protections that we have and it's sharing the information with personal identifiable information, names, social security numbers, addresses. And although you intend to not use this information, the information is out there. And yes, from a data security perspective, that should just frighten people. Um, but it, this, this law is removing so many protections. And I know we're talking about losing funding, but again, this is the government or a government agencies getting paid by another government agency uh, for giving up private health information of our patients, of our citizens. Um, and that's, that's what's really at risk here. Um, and as, as, a, as, a, as a patient, I'll say my data is not for sale. Uh, but what, what, do you, uh, what, what, what do you see this information, Representative Morrison? Um, I mean, just look, look at one thing here. What, what do you see as how we're going to be notifying the physicians? I mean, is this is this really just a blanket? The information for these for your patients with this cancer is going to be provided to the states, and is there a uh, room for them to object? And on what basis do you think a physician would object to, uh, to to not providing their patients private information to forty nine other states plus the federal government? Representative Morrison, uh, there, Madam and, and let me just say too, there is someone on from MDH if if uh, yeah. you choose to call on them. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Munson. I, I will defer to MDH, but I do just want to clarify, this data is not for sale. This We are talking about research dollars to improve the prevention and treatment of cancer. Um, and with that, I'll defer to MDH on the specifics of the data privacy, but I will reiterate, this is the Health Committee, and this is going to Judiciary next. All right. Thank you, Representative Morrison. So we have Ajay Desai, I believe. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. welcome. Please state your name and, and your title and go ahead and answer if you can. Uh, sure. Um, my name is Jay Desai, and I'm the director of the Minnesota Cancer Reporting System at the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and um, <clears throat> Representative Munson. Um, the question about notifying, uh, yes, if what we would do is, uh, as I understand it, is we would contact the attending physician if data was to be released, that's personal information for a particular, um, uh, trying to address a particular cancer uh, issue. And um, as um, was stated earlier, uh, we do have very strong data privacy protection laws that already exist within the state of Minnesota that are similar to what our other healthcare systems have. Uh, and so we would be abiding by those laws. And as we, um, any data that we share with other state registries would also have to abide by the Minnesota state statutes. Okay, Representative Moore, uh, Munson. Follow Thank you, on. Madam Chair. And I just, I'm just asking, I guess I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Desai if, if this is a, I mean, we're not, we're no longer asking for consent from the physician. We're just notifying them. So is it a, is it a letter? Is it an email just saying, we're going to be collecting information for a specific patient, or is it you have 30 days to reject it? I mean, that would be actually negative consent, so that would fall under consent that we had before. You're just basically notifying them that the Department of Health will be collecting this information on these patients, and is, is there an, an option for them to respond and say, I have to talk to my patient first, or uh, there's just is it just a simple email notification that they're going to get 30 a week and, and they're not going to be able to respond to? Mr. Uh, yeah, my understanding is we, we, I mean, we're already collecting this information. This is about re-releasing the information um, for particular uh, studies or, or projects or investigations that we need to do for uh, following up on cancer concerns. Um, and so that would um, be uh, a letter 
to notify them or an email. I mean, you know, whatever is most appropriate. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Representative Bierman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, my question is for Dr. Spector, I believe. Uh, my internet broke up a little bit, but I thought I heard you say that um, we cannot share data with other states. And then I think you mentioned that other states cannot share data with Minnesota. Is that correct? They can. They That's are less expected. willing to do so since we're not able to share with them. And I think it's important to note we are the only state uh, registry that it, that prevents this kind of data sharing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Spector, for that reminder. Um, so I guess my question here is, uh, again, maybe for Dr. Spector, are there other similar data registry systems for other conditions that Minnesota participates already that is uh, very similar to this system? Um, cancer registration. Dr. Spector. It, cancer registration is pretty unique. We don't have a, a heart attack registry. Partly it's because cancer, uh, almost every cancer is looked at in a pathology lab. So there's some hard evidence and a, 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 of cancer in a central place to find it. We do have a birth defects reporting system as well, which operates somewhat similarly, although it, it doesn't claim to be completely population based. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just uh, I just want to close out with uh, a thank you to uh, Dr. Morrison for carrying the bill. I know this is needed and I fully support it. My vote will help at all to get it across the finish line. I'll be voting yes. And I just ask you when you move on to the next committee that you take some of the doctors with you to explain that side of the equation. Um, thanks for your work. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Other questions for members? All right, I have a question, and I'm not sure if this would be for Mr. Desai or one of our, our or oh, Dr. Spector or uh, Dr. Wilman, but um, how long have cancer registries been in existence? And I guess part of that would be to just understand just a little bit more about you know, what are some of the things that have perhaps been achieved through the use of cancer registries that might not have been achieved otherwise? And Dr. Wilman, you look like you're ready to answer that, so I'll go to you. Thank you, Chairman. I would be very happy to answer that question. So the United States government began the creation of tumor registries through the National Cancer Institute or the Center for Disease Control back in the late 1960s. So many state registries have founding dates in the late 60s and early 70s. And it actually began as part of the nation's war on cancer, uh, which was started by President Nixon when that bill was passed to begin to form and challenge and attack the cancer problem. And what we all realized was we didn't even have a good understanding of how cancer affected our communities. What are prevalent cancers in Minnesota? What do we think the causes are? How do we prevent them? And so each state was allowed, usually through state statutes, to begin to create a tumor registry to tap, uh, to develop state cancer data of the patients that it served. Um, being from New Mexico and returning back home to here, I can tell you this data is critical for us to understand what are the predominant cancers in rural communities. In the last few years, we've begun to understand through the state registries program that a person who lives in a rural community's uh, chance of surviving cancer is much less high uh, than a person who lives in an urban center. We're beginning to understand how cancer patterns and cancer causation is related to behaviors and exposures. So the data in a state's cancer registry is absolutely essential to beginning to understand causality and the best means to prevent and treat. I respect the data privacy issues that have been raised. I'm a physician. I understand all about data privacy, but I think it's really important to understand something. Every state registry follows the HIPAA federal requirements for patient privacy. So while individual case data is collected and deposited in the registry, when I, Cheryl Wilman, as a physician at Mayo, ask for state data, that's never given to me with patient identifiers. So for the research that we do, 
Show me the cancer patterns in Olmstead County. Show me the cancer patterns in the 10 cities. All I ever would see is anonymized aggregated percentages and patterns and trends. In any state registry in the United States, to go and actually contact a patient, we would have to get individual patient consent. So it's a real kind of misrepresentation to suggest I could go to a registry and get an individual patient's identity. That just isn't practice in any other state. So to propose a research study or a community intervention study to reduce breast cancer incidence or to increase colorectal cancer screening, if I actually wanted to contact an individual patient, that would have to be done through an approved IRB protocol reviewed by one of our institutions. And that tumor registry would act as a barrier to reach out to a patient to ask if they wanted to participate. That patient then consents or declines. So it's really important to understand the registry holds data and like a vault, just as secure as any hospital system. And it acts as the honest broker to actually interface with people like me to understand patterns and trends. And a patient does gain that individual right to agree to participate or not participate in any of the studies we're talking about. So thank you for that opportunity um, to clarify. All right, thank you for that explanation. So we have a couple more questions, Representative Grunhagen. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, thank good. I, I, I had a hard time getting unmuted. Uh, Representative Morrison, we certainly want to cure cancer wherever we possibly can. Okay, and thanks for bringing the attention on that. But having heard the testimony about some of the patient identifiers and some of the concerns, I, you know, I see both sides of it. Do you have any uh, comments as to how to come to peace in the valley on this in, in those areas? Representative Morrison? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Gernhagen. Uh, you know, I think that um, Dr. Willman just said it brilliantly. Um, I guess I would say let's not hold Minnesota back. Here we have these two great academic research institutions in the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota. It would be a shame if we tied their hands behind their back in trying to do the best possible work. Um, to create the best understanding around cancer so that we can do the best job of preventing and treating it. Uh, Representative okay. Grunhagen, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, okay. Um, let me go to Representative Bonner because Representative Munson has already spoken and then I'll go to Munson. Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you for that, Madam Chair and Representative Morrison and, and thank you for bringing the bill forward. I will tell you that I, I lost my... Uh, grandmother to cancer. And so I, I certainly understand the need to do uh, deep research on this issue. And for those of you who don't know, I do work in the IT space in my regular day job. Um, so I know a great deal about de-identified data. And I think um, I really appreciate, Dr. Williams, that you articulated very carefully um, how the data is being used to match up patients between states um, to make sure that we're not duplicating information between states or specific patients, but that we do have a very set set of protocols for being able to interact with that patient or to use any of their data. And so I, I really am thankful for that clarification. And, you know, it, it's just my professional opinion for whatever it's worth, but I think that certainly gives me as an IT professional a great deal of comfort that we are following really good solid protocols to be able to share that data and to do so responsibly. All right, thank you, Representative Bonner. Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and you know, patient, patient privacy is a big issue for me um, and also cancer research is too. Uh, my father died of cancer, my mom's had it twice and, and you, many of you know that my wife is going through cancer treatment uh, at the Mayo Clinic. So uh, it's really important and she's involved in a lot of studies. Um, and we want to find a cure to it. But I also understand the, the serious risk of uh, people being discriminated against because of their health information. And I also know that government has a horrible history of IT security and data breaches. And this information um, that we can control under Minnesota statutes 
um, while it's within our borders, is important. Once this information is disseminated to 50 other states or 49 other states in the federal government, um, we lose control of that data. And although the, the physicians in those states or the researchers may not access the individual person, you know, the name and address of the patient, um, the information is still housed elsewhere. And that's, that's where I'm, I'm most concerned about this. But I just want to make this, uh, verify this information. You know, HIPAA, people always ask about, is it a violation of HIPAA? HIPAA is more about sharing information with others than it is with protecting it. HIPAA is about patient portability of records and sharing that information with the 2.2 million connected entities. Um, so it's actually, I mean, that's what most states operate under. Minnesota has its own laws. Um, and this is the basis of my concern is just uh, having all of these other kind of, all these other states that are that are uh, that, that have uh, less than stellar IT people working for government trying to protect all of the patient information instead of having a central place or having those outside entities you know view or look at the data uh, at our site it's actually pulling that data to all these other states um, so you know that's that's my basis of my concern and I, I don't think this bill addresses that from a security standpoint. All right, thank you, Representative Munson. And um, we normally our testifiers don't kind of get involved in the conversation, but I'm gonna, Dr. Spector, I'm gonna let you make a comment and then I'm gonna go to yes. uh, Representative Morrison. Thank you. Dr. Um, Spector. I just wanna say the, the release of the data, it doesn't reside at other places in perpetuity. It's used for deduplication and then it's destroyed. So uh, I just wanted that on the record. Thank you, that's very helpful. Okay, um, Representative Morrison, final word. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna thank uh, our testifiers for um, their very helpful testimony today um, and for the work that they do on behalf of all of us in Minnesota. Uh, I hope that everyone will join in supporting this really important change so that we're not holding Minnesota back and we're allowing our great institutions to do the best possible research that they can. Let's, let's end cancer, thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Representative Morrison, and to all of the testifiers. And I, I do want to make a comment also, um, as the chair of this committee, I think people know that I'm very protective of medical information, health information. In fact, I often agree with the Citizens Council on health freedom on some things. But I also think that there has to be a balance between use of information and the importance of what we're using it for. And this is not a, a black and white issue. And um, it's really interesting to me that some members seem to believe in Minnesota exceptionalism. I believe in Minnesota exceptionalism too, but in this case, you know, I think uh, the idea that somehow Minnesota can be an outlier here and that only we can protect information, I think I, I can't quite uh, go with that idea. Um, so I, I do think that um, this is an important bill. Maybe as it moves to judiciary, there could be some comfort language here around some of the things that we've heard today, which are, are very comforting to me, frankly. And, um, but I, I do think that if we're, this is the health committee. In this committee, we, we should be about what is this information gonna do for, for people and their health? And I think it's pretty clear that this is a very, very important topic, and um, we need to make sure that Minnesotans are not disadvantaged in uh, being able to uh, have cancer prevention and cancer treatments and cancer cures. And uh, so um, with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Niedernhofer to call the roll on the bill, and the chair votes aye. And I'm sorry, I should restate that the motion is to send it to the Judiciary Committee. Labeling, aye. Vice Chair Hewitt. Aye. Hewitt, aye. Lead Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Ackland. Ackland, aye. Ackland, aye. Representative Backer. Representative Backer. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner, aye. Representative Bierman. Bierman, aye. Bierman, aye. Representative Bolden. Bolden, aye. Bolden, aye. Representative Damoth. Damoth, aye. Damoth, aye. Representative Freiburg. Freiburg, aye. Freiburg, aye. Representative Grunhagen. No. 
Bernhagen, no. Representative Keel. Keel, aye. Keel, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Munson. Munson, no. Munson, no. Representative Pryor. Pryor, aye. Pryor, aye. Representative Quam. Aye. Quam, aye. Representative Ryer. Ryer, aye. Ryer, aye. Representative Schultz. Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Wolgamot. Wolgamot votes aye. Wolgamot, aye. And then it Representative um, Backer votes aye. Backer, aye. There are 17 ayes and two nays. All right, there being 17 ayes and two nays, the bill, uh, House File, uh, let's see, House File 3871 is re referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Thank you very much to Representative Morrison and to all of our testifiers. And uh, next on our agenda is House File 3636, Representative Ryer, and the motion there is that House File 3636 be laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. And there is an author's amendment, right, Representative Ryer? That's correct, Madam Chair. So uh, Representative Ryer moves uh, the bill to bring it for the committee and the A1 author's amendment to put it in the form in which she'd like to discuss it. So um, voting now on adoption of the A1 author's amendment. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Hi. And any opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So Representative Ryer to your bill as amended. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee. Uh, House file 3636 is the DHS Healthcare Administration Policy Bill. It has 10 sections uh, that um, uh, Ann Bobbs from the Department of Human Services will walk through. Um, the A1 amendment just updated one of the uh, bits in the Ombudsman statute. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Bobbs to take us through the bill. All right. Thank you, Representative Ryer. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Bobbs. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, members. Uh, for the record, Ann Bobbs, I'm the Legislative Director for the Healthcare Administration at DHS. Uh, so thank you for hearing this bill, and thank you to Representative Ryer for carrying it. Um, as she mentioned in her introduction, this is the department's health care policy bill. So I will just provide a high-level walkthrough of the sections in the bill for members, and I do have policy staff on hand who can help answer some more technical questions on the bill. So sections 1, 7, and 8 of the bill provide updates to statute to better outline the roles and responsibilities of the Managed Care Ombudsman Office. The primary role of the managed care ombudsman is to be advocates for Minnesota healthcare program enrollees who are enrolled in managed care plans. The existing statute today is only a single paragraph that was written in 1987 to cover the metro area managed care demonstration project. And over the past 20 years, the managed care program has expanded statewide and expanded populations to include seniors and people with disabilities. This proposal updates statutes to better reflect the work the office does and who they serve. The bulk of the changes are in Section 7, while Sections 1 and 8 correct cross-references cross elsewhere in statute. And the amendment adopted by the committee provides additional clarification within this section. Section 2 is a technical clarification in statute to clarify that all children placed in foster care or kinship assistance in Minnesota are automatically eligible for medical assistance. The 2019 legislature extended automatic MA eligibility to children in foster care who are not Title IV-E eligible or who are receiving non-Title IV-E kinship assistance. DHS implemented this new law as of January 1, 2021, and the intent of the law was to include all children in foster care or kinship care who are not eligible for Title IV-E funding, and that is how the change was implemented by the department. This technical change clarifies statute to more accurately reflect the intent of that change and DHS implementation of the law. Section 3 is a reorganization of statute to move the section clarifying that children under age 21 are not subject to an asset limit to the same section of statute as all other asset limit provisions. This does not change how this policy is implemented, just moves where it lives in statute. Section 4 is 
Sections 4 and 5 remove outdated language in light of the Federal Deficit Reduction Act of 2006. The paragraph being removed prohibits certain purchases of annuities by institutionalized individuals or their spouses who are applying for or enrolled in medical assistance for long-term care services unless certain criteria are met. The subdivision applies to annuity purchases on or after March 1 of 2002. However, the Federal Deficit Reduction Act of 2006 superseded state law and state law was subsequently amended to comply with federal law. However, subdivision one paragraph D was never removed. Uh, section four is just an update to a cross-reference while section five of the bill removes that outdated language. Section six clarifies that the use of accessible video-based platforms used for telehealth are included in the definition of telehealth. This does not change current policy or practice as was passed by the legislature last session. And as a reminder, the 2021 legislature did extend the use of audio only telehealth until next June. That analysis is still underway by the department. The language that passed during the 2021 session defines telemedicine as the use of audio and video telecommunications. However, individuals from the deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing communities have articulated that in using telemedicine, they may only use the video function. Although members may be using a telehealth platform that supports both audio and video, both functions are not always used depending on the individual's abilities. So this policy change will ensure that all members enrolled in medical assistance can use the mode that is most appropriate for their needs and remove any confusion as to whether or not the mode is allowable. Section 9 repeals statute related to the revocability of trust instruments as a result of a recently published Minnesota Court of Appeals decision which held that federal Medicaid law preempts this section of law. Federal law is more permissive than the existing state law, and DHS has already taken the steps necessary to comply with this court ruling and have issued a bulletin to county and tribal eligibility workers regarding this change. This section repeals the language that was preempted by federal law from the court ruling. And finally, Section 10 is a repealer that repeals the language being reorganized by the proposals for around asset limits for children and the managed care ombudsman. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, that completes the walkthrough of the bill. And as mentioned, I do have policy staff on the call with me who are available to help with questions. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Bops. There's a lot in there. And are there any questions from members? We do have another testifier. Uh, maybe I should go to the other testifier and then go to questions. So excuse me. I will go to uh, Amy Gresky. Welcome. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, my name is Amy Gresky. I am here in my capacity as Vice President of the Minnesota Chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, or NALA for short. Um, I would like to first apologize to Representative Rayer for not being able to get in touch with her prior to this hearing about our concerns related to her bill. So I apologize for that. And I would also like to thank DHS for including the partial repeal of 501c1206 in their bill. Um, our concern is solely uh, related to section nine of the bill. Uh, as Ms. Bob said, there was a, a court of appeals case that found that statu uh, Minnesota statutes 501C1206 was preempted by federal law um, and that uh, irrevocable trust not become revocable just because someone is applying for medical assistance. Um, and so we are great. We appreciate that the, the fact that DHS is, is putting this in their agency bill and the steps they have taken thus far to ensure that this case is followed. However, we do have concerns with leaving paragraph A in statute. Um, our concern with leaving paragraph A in statute is that as a public policy stance, it says that trust instruments cannot be used, uh, which, is, which is not the case both at the federal level and in state statute. In fact, the section right before 501c1206, 1205, lists various types of trust that an individual can use while still maintaining their Medicaid eligibility. So we believe that by uh, leaving paragraph A in, it creates um, some, it can create some confusion and some ambiguity um, and potentially lead to more cases like the case uh, that repealed this section in future, even though uh, the Court of Appeals has already decided that the, the statute was preempted by federal law. Therefore, we oppose the current language, but would be in full support of a full repeal. Um, Minnesota chapter of NALA has been advocating for a full repeal of 501c1206 for a number of years. The legislature, the current full repeal bill is uh, being held by 
being authored by Representative Schulmacher. It is House Bill 1241. And so we would greatly appreciate a full repeal of 501c1206 rather than a partial. All right. Thank you, Ms. Gresky. Appreciate that. And um, okay. And, and of course, uh, just to say the bill is being laid over for possible inclusion. And that, uh, you know, does also give us opportunity, gives the author opportunity to speak with you, perhaps, or to make other inquiries about it and what possible amendments might be needed, uh, if any, as we go forward here. So um, any questions or comments from members? All right, not seeing any. So uh, back to you, Representative Ryer, final word. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bobs, for your walkthrough. I appreciate that. Uh, you did it so much better than I would have. And Ms. Gresky uh, would be happy to hear from you. Um, and with that, I just uh, look forward to it being laid over and included as we move forward. All right, thank you very much, Representative Ryer. So um, with that, House File 3636 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in the health finance bill. So uh, we have reached the end of our agenda a few minutes early. I don't know how that ever happens, but here we are. So uh, I think it's getting to be spring outside. So um, thank you. Thank you again to all of the testifiers and to all of the members. And, uh, and um, with that, we will see you all tomorrow. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.